Uh, hey, I don't know a better introduction to this message today than that. Let's give him one more hand. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, my name is Alan, and I am a friend of Trace, a uh, pastor here in town, uh, and I love that every single time. That is so good. Such a perfect start to a message on discipleship. Start with me by imagining this scenario. So a young lady exits college and lands what she thinks is her dream job. So she's excited for this next season and she works at, at a place and she garners the favor of her boss and they love her and what she does and what she brings to the team and they're going to open a new division. So they go to her and they say, we see it in you. You've got what it takes. We want you to be the division leader. So the first thing she does is she walks out of the office, she calls her parents and says, hey, that college degree actually was worth it, and I'll pay off my student loans faster. So she celebrates with her parents, she calls her friends, goes out and uh, celebrates that night, and then comes home with this gnawing question in the pit of her stomach, oh no, I have to be a leader. What exactly is a leader? And she makes the fatal mistake that we've probably all made before. She says, oh, maybe I'll just read a few books on it. So she goes to this small website called Amazon, and she types in leadership. And she finds over 200,000 books on leadership, and she's stunned. Oh, no, now I'm even more confused than where I was. Now, that scenario to me is so common in my life, in our lives. Isn't information overwhelming these days? I mean, there's so much of it. Think about the word disciple. There's over 10,000 books on Amazon right now, which is a little bit disheartening because one of them is mine. I wonder how anyone can ever find it in the process of, of all that, but it's confusing, right? There's so much information out there today. And so if you're walking in today going, I don't know who this Jesus guy is or I'm barely getting to know this Jesus guy, but I certainly don't want to know what it's like to be a follower, a disciple of his, this message is for you today. So I think many of us are suffering from information overwhelm. There's so much out there that I don't know what applies to me. And I think we're asking these questions about being a follower of Jesus. What is it? What is a disciple? And secondly, what do I actually do? What, what do I need to do to be a disciple? And so as we dig into this message today, you'll hear something, this thread throughout it of an invitation. Jesus was always throwing out an invitation to follow him. Come follow me. Come follow me, something bigger, greater that beckons us on in our relationship with Jesus. But as we think about Scripture, it can be overwhelming, right? There's so much in the Bible. And here's the great news today. You don't have to know everything about God to become a disciple of His Son, Jesus. Ah, you can breathe deep a little bit this morning. So that's good news. Being a disciple isn't dependent on what you know. It's dependent on obedience. And really, in this case, becoming like Jesus. Imitation. Imitating the life of Jesus, the one that we love. So let me give you the one thing this morning, very important. The essence of a disciple is imitation, not information. The essence, the heart of a disciple is imitation, not information. Let me shift this just a little bit. What is more important about Jesus is not what you know about him, but that you know him. The who behind the what. Now, Aaron introduced this series with this question, are you hiding behind the word Christian? Or are you hiding comfortably behind the word Christian? Now, let me just say this. I don't believe there's any more social advantage in our culture of being called a Christian anymore. It used to be that being called a Christian, people wanted to live near you. People wanted to interact with you. Maybe they trusted your integrity a little bit more. Today, that's flip-flopped. And people say, I don't want to deal with those Christians, those intolerant, hypocritical Christians. That's very common. Now, if you're saying, well, what do you know about that? Uh, I'm a pastor, right? I am the party killer. When they ask me the question, so what do you do for a living? It's like, eh, it's not much of a living, but here's what I do. Um, and so, yeah, that kills a party very quickly. And so when you think about hiding behind this word Christian, introducing this new term, which is a really, really old term called disciple. Now, Corey, last week, talked about this phrase. I love it. Grace is completely free, but following Jesus, it's going to cost you. Grace is free, but following Jesus is going to cost you. We're not trying to trick anyone into coming over the line of faith. 
There's this process, this beautiful baptism process that we see this morning, this process of following Jesus that involves taking your next right step, not just thinking your next right thought about Jesus. Many of us love to live inside of the next idea and the next dream, but truthfully, we need to take action. And so we're going to follow this thread of invitation toward imitation this morning. We're going to see three encounters where Jesus calls people closer. Would you come closer? Would you follow me in that essence of imitation that we're going to chase this morning? Now, let me throw out some big statements uh, to you this morning. They'll come up here on the screen. Very, very important for us to keep in mind, but I promise you I'll break these down. Number one, information can be memorized, but imitation is cultivated. It's cultivated. You can't just memorize a relationship with Jesus. Secondly, information is about the mind. Imitation is about action. This is about action and being called closer to Jesus. And lastly, information can be mastered, but imitation is a journey. You can't master following Jesus. It is a journey. We're going to break down all those. So soundbite number one, discipleship is cultivated. My dad used to tell me this phrase growing up, and I hated it, and I didn't believe it to the core, but he would say, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Maybe your parents said the same thing to you. I didn't believe it. I didn't want to believe it. It was usually said in the lens of, hey, I don't think those kids are going the place that you want to go with your life. But as I look back and now have kids of my own, it's so true. Some people have said you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. More and more, I believe that is true. That who we are letting impact us has a whole lot to do with what we do, what we say, what we think, and who we become. And so as, as we think about that idea of cultivating, let me just ask you a really hard question. Who are you letting cultivate you? Who are you letting cultivate you? And secondly, is that a good thing? Do you want to live the life that they are living? Many times, I think we want pieces of other people's lives, and then we look at it and go, but I don't, I don't want their life. Truthfully, I've been convicted about many of the podcasts that I consume. There's parts of their life that I like and admire, but everything else, I'd, I'd say, no, that's not the direction that I want to go. And we have to be very discerning of what we listen to, what we ingest, what we take in, because that is the product of what's going to come out of our lives. And I've actually had to stop listening to certain podcasts because I say, I don't want to become like them. I don't want to talk like them. I don't want to live like them. Who are you letting cultivate your life? Because eventually you're going to imitate them. When we think about the, the studying, the watching in our culture today, many people are trying to impact us, right? Marketing and messaging and many people are, are bringing messages at us, selling products, ideas, thoughts, quotes, memes, whatever else it is. Be careful who is cultivating us because that will have a massive impact on who we become. St. Augustine said, we become what we adore. We become what we adore. What do you adore? Because I can tell you that will be ingested and will come out into your life. Who is shaping you and is that a good thing? But this second soundbite, we're going to spend most of our time on this morning. Discipleship is about action. Discipleship is more than knowing, and I'm so grateful for this, because I don't know everything that there is to know about the Bible, about God, about Scripture, even about the life of Jesus. There's days when I come up on stages like this as a pastor trembling, thinking, how am I supposed to share a message that I barely am beginning to comprehend? So if you walk in here today, and you feel like, well, I don't know everything about God, I don't even know all of why and fully what I believe, join the club. Please don't pretend that you have it all together, you have it all memorized, that you know everything that there is about God. Remember, this is a journey, but discipleship is about action. What I love about Jesus is he's always asking people to come closer. Follow me, follow me. This was very common for rabbis back in the day. They would say to follow with the dust of the rabbi, to walk along with them, to learn with and among their life, not just sitting in a desk, but literally walking roads with them, having conversations with them, and Jesus does the same. We often celebrate these disciples. If you've been in church any amount of time, you've heard these stories about how he takes these regular, ordinary guys and invites them closer to imitate his life. Here we go. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. 
They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Any fishermen in the room? All right, I love some fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus says, and I will send you out to fish for people. So they're pretty confused at this moment. Despite their confusion, what happens? At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So kind of a crazy thing, right? If you're brothers and you're fishermen, you know he's going to ask you to to come along. That's the, the common thread here. But there's an invitation. Before they even know what they're getting into, he says, come, come closer, follow me. Learn who I am and what I am about. Now, what's interesting is this is very, very common. Rabbis in that time would invite people closer, would invite them into this apprenticeship of sorts to come closer. So what's crazy is not what he did, the invitation to come closer. What's crazy about Jesus is who he invited. Would any of us say that these people form the dream team right here? Like, would you be asking these people to come along with you? I don't think so. None of us would. Some people have even said, when did the disciples actually become Christians? I mean, if you study it, they're kind of knuckleheads even to the end, right? It gives us hope. It gives us hope that God would invite these salt-of-the-earth people along with them to learn, to, to become more like him, that invitation into that and who he invited in. Now, the next one, the next salt-of-the-earth person he invites in is a tax collector, Now, tax collectors were not like the IRS today. They were like in shady biz. They were taking money for themselves and all that. Let's follow this encounter and this invitation. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and, let me say, notorious sinners, known sinners in the town, came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Guys, there's so much to unpack here, but let me share a personal story. I remember being a couple years into being pastor and accidentally I had insulated myself in the course of the week around all Christians. Very easy to do if you're a pastor. I had no ongoing, meaningful, regular relationships with anyone who didn't know Jesus. And I remember I was reading this passage and I was thinking through this in the time. I was learning more information about what it might look like to go build relationships with people who didn't know Jesus. I was reading all the books and I was reading all the scripture. I was even seeing that Jesus did it. You know the only problem? I wasn't doing anything about it. And I remember the moment that God said to me, stop reading and start doing. I've had many of those moments in my life. Stop reading information about me and start becoming more like my son Jesus. That opened up a journey for me, for my wife, for our family, of saying maybe God has put us around our physical neighbors. There are people in the city that truthfully I know, but I haven't cultivated a real relationship with. And that was a moment where I said there's a gap. There's a difference between the life Jesus lived and the life that I live. And we need to bring those closer together. He's telling me to do things that I'm like, yep, good idea, Jesus. I'm just not going to do it. And that's not how it works. The invitation to come closer to Jesus The invitation to take the next right step, and that's what it was for me. What is it for you? What's your next right step toward action in Jesus? Now, this next story story is one of the saddest stories in all of Scripture to me because it's another story of invitation with a very different ending, saying, what does it take? What's my next step, Jesus? And we see this unfold. All we know is it's a young man, and he had wealth, and he had status, He was young, he had wealth, and he had status. That's all that we know about this guy. Another day, a man stopped Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you question me about what's good? God is the one who is good. If you want to enter the life of God, just do what he tells you. The man asked, What in particular? 
Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbors as you do yourself. The young man said, I've done all that. What's left? If you want to give it all you've got, Jesus replied, go sell your possessions. Give everything to the poor. All your wealth will then be in heaven. Then come follow me. That was the last thing the young man expected to hear, and so crestfallen, he walked away. He was holding on tight to a lot of things he couldn't bear to let go. What things are you holding on so tight that you just can't let them go? He's saying, I've given that and I've obeyed that and and I understand this, but that's my last 5%. What's your last 5%? What's the last thing that you're holding on to? To say, God, you can have it all, you just can't have that. That last 5%, he, he literally walks away from the Son of God with flesh wrapped on him. He walks away from the Son of God. Here is what it takes, and he's saying, not worth it to me. Now, before we throw too many rocks at this guy, which I think is easy to do, saying, what an idiot, why would you do that? I do that every day. I do that every week. Is, is I choose what I want. That last 5% to say, no, God, you can't have that. And it's called sin and it needs to be confessed. When I put that thing over God, here's the last thing that I'm white knuckling and tucking away. Maybe your friends, maybe your spouse don't even know about it. But that last thing, I'm not willing to give that up, God. What is that for you? And he walks away sad. And here's what Jesus doesn't say. Study me more. Learn more about me. Make sure that you read everything that I have done and am going to do. No, he says, come. There's an invitation, follow me, change the way you live, orient your life toward me and not toward the wealth and the status that you had. What is your last 5%? And here is what we know, is that love is not about knowledge, love is about action. Love is not about knowing about people or about things, but it is actually doing things. And Corey said it last week, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you to orient your life toward Jesus. Now, uh, let me give an example here, a modern-day example. Uh, Wives, I'm talking to you here, so husbands, I'm accidentally talking to you here. So think about an anniversary. Your your husband is about to come home from work, and and it's your anniversary, and he said, I got something special for us tonight. So you dressed up, and you know, you've you've got some ideas. He's going to surprise you with something. Uh, And he says, honey, sit down. And so you sit down on the couch, you know, he has your hands in, in his, and, and he says, so I know that you love daisies, and I, I just wanted you to know that I know that, and, and that I memorized that, okay? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, but, but that's not all. Sit back down. He says, but, but I also know that you have a favorite restaurant, and you have a favorite dish. It's salmon, and it's bonefish grill. Yeah. Okay, and so he then walks away and binges on Netflix all night and ends up in the doghouse. It requires action, doesn't it? Knowledge is not enough. And by the way, I did check with Aaron and Emily before sharing the story. That wouldn't be cool at all if I were to tell that on Aaron. So I hear he's coming a long way uh, in that, you know, you can continue to encourage him uh, in that. But not cool to, to share stories without checking with somebody first. On that, It's not about knowledge. We know that's not enough. We know that's not enough in relationship. We know that's not enough for friendships, for marriage, for our kids. But somehow we believe it's enough if we just know enough about God right here. That maybe, just maybe, that's it. And we find it doesn't move the needle in our obedience. It doesn't reorient our lives just to know things. It actually takes action and doing things to, to move to that level. I love this verse talking about the action that it's going to take. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Guys, there's so much information today. We are in the information age. We're experiencing information overwhelm. There's so much talk today. That doesn't cost anything to learn something, to ingest something into our minds. That doesn't cost anything for us to talk about something. What costs is the doing. That is orienting our lives toward Jesus. The cost of discipleship that Bonhoeffer wrote about, that Corey talked about last week. A friend of mine said this. He said, why do all the missionaries get all the cool stories? 
It's because they're doing their next right thing. Many of them come back from crazy experiences and crazy stories. Some of the stories that I could tell you from friends of mine, I mean, the hairs on the back of your neck just rise up. From the clutches of death, I mean, miracles that happen, rescuing them, you know, from life and limb just to be able to be back with us because they took their next right step. The kingdom of God consists in power, not just in more information and more talk. Now, uh, I, I do want to brag on my kids a little bit. Uh, my kids are ninjas before bed, okay? Maybe you've experienced this same kind of thing. They don't remember anything they have to do all day long, but magically right before bed, it all comes to them. They remember all the things they had to do all day long. Suddenly, they're like, actually, I was hungry, and I need to eat. You know what? I actually didn't do my chores earlier. I'm going to start doing those. And all of that right before bed. It's amazing. Their memory is incredible in those last five minutes of the day. All I want before bed, frankly, is for these kids just to go to bed. So it's really, you know, late, and it's been a long day. And, and I say, kids, I got two things for you. Same two things every night. Doesn't change. Go pee. Go brush your teeth. I'll see you in bed. Like, really, really simple. And it's amazing. They're ninjas. They figure out ways. I can't even find them around the house. They're doing something else. Where, where are they? And, and the, you know, sort of group think, and they all, like, break out to different sides of the house, and they're working together somehow. They are ninjas right before bed. And then they actually can teleport, too. Like, as soon as you put them to bed, it looks like they're falling asleep, and then they're actually upstairs faster than I am at, at our door. Like, go to bed, Right? I'm a patient father, so I don't say it like that, of course, and I know you guys are as well, but the, just the scenario at, at our house. And what's interesting is sometimes I'll go down and say, um, so, yeah, uh, I just needed you to pee and brush your teeth. And I'll hear this, yeah, yeah, I know, Dad, I know. I'm like, honestly, I don't really care if you know, I care that you did it. Like, just, you literally had two jobs. Go do them, all right? Yeah, yeah, I, I know, Dad. And many times I think we do that to God. Yeah, yeah, God, I know, I know. Yeah, but you didn't do anything in a much more patient way as a father than I come across. And I, and I hear that in this scripture. This is Luke 6, verse 46. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? Why do you keep calling me Daddy, Daddy, when you don't do the things I ask you to do? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me listens to my teaching, and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the floodwaters rise and break against the house, it stands firm because it's well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruin. Guys, one of the hardest things for me, something that grieves me to the core, is when I see people that just stopped obeying Jesus, that just sort of fell out of love with Jesus, and there are always other consequences in their lives. Something crashes and something burns, and their life appears to be in a mess, and maybe it was 8% or 0.8% off, just a few degrees off, and they find themselves out in in no man's land, I'm telling you guys, that grieves me to the core and the, when the brokenness of life comes out. And yes, hard things happen that have nothing to do with our obedience and, and our actions. But when I see those things and go, oh, like, wh when did you not stop, or when did you stop living this way? When did you not wake up out of bed and say, today I'm orienting my life around Jesus? It grieves me to the core and there are consequences for that. And obviously not beyond God's grace, but there's wreckage in the way. Guys, we can't build a life on good ideas and dreams. We have to build a life on constant action of reorienting our lives toward Jesus. So when I think about it, people that, that I, I grieve those situations that are in hard moments of the life, they didn't just wake up one day and think, yeah, I should go have an affair. That would be a great decision. I should just go ship, shipwreck my family and my life. That would be a great decision. No, something was happening in the meantime. Guys, there's never been a better moment to reorient your life than right now. Than right now. Discipleship is about action. God wants his kids not only to know what he says, but to obey, to take their next right step. Guys, what's your next right step today? You heard it today from the baptismal just taking my next right step. What's your next right step? Don't think about your next 30 steps. Sometimes I think we're paralyzed. 
in the age of information overwhelm, we're paralyzed with all the things we could be doing, right? We have FOMO, fear of missing out, and we're thinking, oh, I could be doing this or this. Just do your next right thing. Friends, don't boil the ocean. Just do your next right thing. What is your next right thing in reorienting your life toward Jesus? Think about this. You want to fight justice and inequality in our world. Please don't go to Facebook. Uh, Please don't type in how to be uh, overwhelmed or how to be outraged or how to fight against something. Go straight back to Jesus. How did Jesus push against injustice? How did Jesus push against inequality? Want to learn to be a man? Don't feel like you had a relationship with your dad where your dad shaped you in that. Go to Jesus, the most manly man that has ever walked the earth in grace and humility and strength. Want to learn to be wise in dealing with people? Go straight to Jesus, the wisest man who ever lived. And learn to live like Jesus. Don't just think about Jesus in your mind. What would it be like to actually live like him? Want to be a great parent? I believe discipleship starts at home, but it is so hard sometimes to know, what do I teach my kids? There's 84 million devotionals out there. There's all these things I could be doing. It can get so overwhelming. How do I, how do, I do that? And let me just invite you into something really, really simple, something that our family does, and it doesn't happen every week. There are weeks where I think, oh man, you know, I try to beat myself up or I got too busy, but get back on the horse. We call it a huddle. It's really, really simple. We open scripture together and we read it. That's it. We open scripture together, usually about the life of Jesus, and read it. And we'll ask questions afterwards. And let me tell you this. My kids put me to shame. Because unlike those last five minutes of the day, normally kids, they actually do stuff. They get an idea and they actually go do it. And that's one thing that I love about kids. That's one thing I love about my own kids. So a couple weeks ago, um, my kids got this idea that the coolest toys ever were the boxes that we had in our house. And so for the last two weeks, my kids don't want to play with any toys. They just want to play with these boxes. They sleep in them half the night and look super uncomfortable. They play in them all day. I, I literally came home, you know, one day and was like, man, they wanted to play with the boxes and that's all they've done. And I couldn't find one of them. I was like, where, where is he? I pull a blanket off the box. This is on a snow day, by the way. And it was like an oven, like he'd been cooking in there all day long. And it was like, it, it's, I sense like a terrarium mist come out there. It smelled like a middle school locker room. I mean, it was awful. Um, But anyway, discipleship, neither here nor there. Uh, Kids do stuff, except in the last five minutes of the day at our house. They do stuff. They take action. So we're out studying the words of Jesus, and and I'm thinking like, yeah, let's just kind of eat a donut here and study this, and and then we'll go home. Uh, And one of them says, you know what? We were literally talking about how to love our neighbors. And in my mind, I'm like, so what would be a good way to love our neighbors? Thinking we should just talk about it, right? It would be good to talk about that. And they're like, well, Linda's husband died a couple months ago, so maybe we should get her some chocolate, make her a card, and go deliver it to her house. (laughs) Puts me to shame. Because they're like, let's actually do it. And too many times in life we get sucked back into this idea of like, oh, that's just a good idea. Let's just think about it for a little bit. But to actually do that, to reorient our lives around obedience, not just ideas. Because I don't believe that ideas change the world. I believe that action changes the world. That, that can turn an idea, can turn a dream into something that literally can change the world. Guys, we have to stop looking at other people as our model for life change and transformation. Sure, learn from other people. But if you want to learn how to be a man, don't just watch Liam Neeson go get his family back all the time and think that's what it is to be a man. Don't just go read Tony Robbins. Don't just go read about Steve Jobs' life. Learn from other people, but ultimately say, my life is oriented around Jesus, not those other people. What would that look like to orient your life around Jesus? To actually take your next right step. What would that look like? To actually do what we see in Scripture. And that's costly, isn't it? That's costly to do that. And here's what I believe. I'm I'm hearing it more and more in our culture today. We've never understood better since the the history of the world that we're built for more. We have this nagging sense that like just waking up and doing an eight to five that we don't care about isn't enough. I'm hearing it all over our culture. Like, ah, it just feels like I'm built for more than this. I'm hearing business owners say, it just feels like it's more than making money. 
I'm hearing leaders say, it feels like more than just doing this thing, but actually maybe we should do something bigger, something different. And here's what I know to be true is that we are drawn to, tra- to transformation. Humans are drawn to transformation. When they see life change in somebody else, I want to get close to it and go, what happened? How would you do that? I see on Facebook sometimes somebody starts their journey, they lose 50 pounds, and I'm like, what's the question I'm going to ask them? How'd you do it? How'd you do it? Because lots of people start that journey, but they actually did it. We're drawn to transformation. And, and what I found is that many times we think that information will change everyone else around us, but transformation sucks people in. People are drawn to it. When your life is changed, I want to know why, and I want to know how mine can be as well. There's a guy named Steve Addison. And he studied God, God movements from the beginning of time, major movements of God, uh, even into modern day uh, across the world and uh, in the Middle East right now. And, and he studied all these God movements and he said, how? How did they do it? How did millions and sometimes billions uh, of people through the course of all those generations in an area come to know Jesus? How did they do it? Spoiler alert. The end of the book, he said, the number one thing that he could tell in all of these was this. Transformed people transform the world. Changed people change others. Is that we're drawn to transformation. We're not drawn to just a good idea or more information. But when we see people imitating, when we see lives changed by Jesus, I want to know what's behind it. The natural response to the best things in our life is to go live them. And other people say, what is that? I have friends who don't know Jesus who think crazy things about me being a pastor, and they've even said it. Some things I can't say here um, because they're four-letter words and whatnot. They just don't understand how or why I'm a pastor. They think, oh, you're like a normal human sometimes, and you're also a pastor. Like, that's super weird, and they don't get it. And, um, and when they begin to ask me about it, but the, eventually they want to talk about friendship. Man, your friends are some of the best humans on earth. Man, like marriage, I, I want a marriage like that. And after about 15 minutes, I'm like, man, I don't know what else to tell you. It's just Jesus. Like if there's stuff you admire about me and about us, it's Jesus. If there's stuff you don't, that's just me, right? That's just me being cranky. That's just the flesh. Don't imitate that. But that's Jesus. Like I don't have any spare answers hanging around there. Like it's Jesus. Transformed people transform the world. Changed people change others. Soundbite number three. Discipleship is a journey. It's a journey. And if you've been transformed and other people want to come along on that journey, it's a beautiful thing when we invite them in. C.S. Lewis talked about this idea of Christian. Aaron said many times we can hide behind this word of being a Christian. What does it actually mean? This sheds some light on it. C.S. Lewis says, The church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, to make little Christs. If they are not doing that, All the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermon, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. God became man, wrapped flesh around Jesus so we could see and relate and know what it's like to be a human and to live that way. When I read scripture, there is hope. When I get tired, I'm like, well, actually, Jesus took a nap. Maybe I should as well. <laughs> oh, man, Jesus honored Sabbath. Maybe I should honor it as well. I mean, just the little things that go, I can identify with that. That's reachable. But every journey, the first part of the journey is the hardest. The first step is the hardest. I realize if I can put my running shoes right there and I can get them on and I can get out of the door, I'm going to go running, right? The problem is not me quitting when I'm 100 feet you know, out my front doorstep, the problem is me actually not getting there. And so again, that question, what's your next right step? For a season, I worked down in Antarctica. That's a whole long story. It was the coldest summer of my life. I worked outdoors for 12 hours a day for that season. And I could tell you this, there would be days I'd wake up and the wind is just swirling and howling and it just looks so nasty outside. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. Like, take a 12-hour beating from this cold. You know what the hardest step was? The first one. I would be standing looking at that rusty metal door like, oh, I don't want to do this. I really don't want to go out there. And then I'd go out there and be just fine. The first step is the hardest. So what's your first step? 
What's your next right step of obedience, of orienting your life toward Jesus? Not just learning about him, but becoming more like him. Jesus, the God who put on flesh. What's your next right step? And I love that Trace has organized this so easily. I want to draw your attention here. This idea of a D1 Bible study. Very, very simple process that you're invited into. And by the way, discipleship is simple and hard. It's really simple, but sometimes it can be hard to take that next step. So to simplify it even more, I love this. One chapter. Just tackle a chapter at a time and ask God to speak to you. One verse. Write down the scripture that stands out to you the most. Maybe there's one verse that sticks out the most. One thought. What insight or inquiry does this verse bring to mind? One moment. Take one minute to listen and respond to God in prayer. And one person. Who are you going to share your findings with today? It's one. The first step is the hardest. Some of you walk in here today and say, I could never be a good enough Christian. I could never know enough about God to be able to go share my faith. Remember, it isn't knowledgeable people change the world, but transformed people transform the world. Changed people change the world. If Jesus has changed you, then you've got what it takes to take your first step. I would not say that those pre-disciples were ready to be disciples, but then Jesus called them. He invited them, and they followed, and they were ready, and they joined the journey. Don't be so petrified about what you don't know, who you aren't, the experiences you don't have. Just be the person that God has created you to be and go follow Jesus. Take your first right step. And there's good news. The essence of a disciple is not to know everything, but the essence of a disciple is imitation, not information. The heart of discipleship is about following. So I just want to leave you with these two questions and then want to pray over you this morning. What's your next right step? in following Jesus? What's your next right step in following Jesus? And secondly, when will you do it? Maybe in the course of this sermon you've thought, oh, that's what I need to do. I need to be part of this. I need to join this group. I need to to start D1. I need to, and I'm not trying to add a heap, a list of things on you out of shame or guilt, but just to say we've all got a next step and it's different for all of us. What's your next right step and when will you take it? Let's pray. God, I thank you that you didn't say, learn everything you ever need to know about me and then you can be my disciple. But you call us, God, you invite us to reorient our lives around the gospel that says that your son came to earth, became fully man, was killed for us, crucified for us, but then raised again to give us life. And if we've been changed by that message, we have the seeds of change in us, God. If we've been transformed by you, you invite us to come along and also to transform other people. What is our next right step? And would you give us the courage to take that step? And all of God's people said, amen.